Hello, everyone. Hello, everyone. Hello, everyone. Um, this has been a very, very interesting last few days since Thursday. Um, Thursday, we had Valerie Jarrett on. And Thursday was the day that we had the president talking about Lysol, injections of Lysol. And then over the weekend, he was talking about he was being sarcastic. No, he wasn't. Um, it's about managing the message and with me, who just popped up on the screen, someone who understands about managing the message, one of the coolest people you will ever meet. Um, <laughs> he has to look at his daughter about that. Natalie, hey, Natalie. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, one of the coolest people you will ever meet, another HBCU or Morehouse grant. I'm Morgan, he's Morehouse. But most importantly, the man who understands about immigration, about borders, about what it looks like to take care, protect and serve a nation during a crisis. And I'm talking about none other than former Homeland Security Head, Jay Johnson. Secretary Johnson, thank you so much for joining me. April, how could I say no? Thank you so much for hosting me on this platform, on this show. Yeah. I'm looking forward to our discussion. Welcome, yes. to, welcome to our home in Montclair, New Jersey. Yes, it's a lovely home. I understand we're going to see more of it later on. And let's say hi to his daughter, Natalie, who literally, I mean, you guys have been with me. You guys, hey, Natalie. You guys have been this is with Natalie me. Marguerite Johnson. All right, Natalie Marguerite. <laughs> Resident <laughs> of Brooklyn, thing. New York. Excuse me? Resident of Brooklyn, New York. All right, I've got family in Brooklyn, so I gotta hook you two up, hook you guys up. <laughs> so listen, um, I've had trouble getting people on who are very cerebral and help save the world, and it takes someone in the family to get them on. Natalie, I thank you. <laughs> Natalie was the one who gave the secretary an account and all of that. Guys, I need you to tell everyone to join in because we're gonna talk about everything that's been going on over the last few months, but most importantly, over these last few days. Um, let me give you his credentials before we go even further. Before we go further, Natalie, thank you. you. Natalie is also a fellow broadcaster as well. Natalie, talk about your new show real fast. Oh, yes. Talk? So I am producing a new show on Vice TV called Seat at the Table with Anand Girdadas. It just aired last Wednesday, mm. our premiere episode. It Tell them who your first guest was. Our first guest was Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez. Really? Yes. And this week we have Hassan Minaj, Representative Katie Porter, um, Anthony Scaramucci, and Vic DiBitetto. Anthony Scaramucci? I hadn't heard yeah. of yeah. him. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Anthony, he's a handful, Anthony but he's Scaramucci. We got some diversity going on here. Right. <laughs> How about that? So when are you going to get your dad on? Because he's the man. He knows <laughs> what should and should not be happening right now. Oh, yeah. yeah. Separation of church and state. <laughs> oh, girl, bye. Anyway, <laughs> so let me, well, congratulations on the show. Welcome. Thank you. And you've been in this business, but welcome to your new platform. We support you. And anything you need, I'm here. Um, Because you, cause you hooked the sister up. But getting your dad on, I thank you so much. Your followers, um, April. She needs your followers. She needs your followers. Your following, so, your large your handle, following. What's your handle, Natalie? We know your coattails are long. I am Natalie Dot Lay Johnson. <laughs> okay, all right. Um, my coattails are long, but you have a long list of people that you hang with. Um, I have one of your classmates and friends, Sam Jackson, and his wonderful life, wife, uh, Latanya. I, I don't want to get. I don't want to get too technical on you, April. But he is a little bit older than me. I'm <laughs> well, class one of your seventy-nine. Friends, one of your, yeah. your, your fellow comrades By, at uh, Morehouse. Uh, Martin Luther King III and a few others. Sam Spike Jackson. Lee, Spike Lee. Spike Lee. Uh, he's class of 79. I'm class of 79. Sam Jackson's just a little bit older. Well, he's bad. He's bad. He's shaft. Damn yeah. right. Yes. Anyway, Absolutely. moving on. <laughs> so listen, Secretary Johnson, uh, you're the former United States Secretary of Homeland Security. Um, you're, you're now serving as a lawyer. Um, you were a lawyer before you became that, but you also worked in the Department of Defense uh, as general counsel from 2009 to 2012. Correct. And um, you were appointed by 
Clinton and Obama in different in various places. You were appointed by appointed by Clinton in DOD and appointed by Obama to Homeland Security. Let's start this off um, right now. What is not working, in your opinion, from that lofty perch that you once sat? Where do I begin? So in a crisis like the one we're in right now with, with COVID, the Department of Homeland Security really should be at the forefront and the centerpiece. And FEMA in particular, which is part of Homeland Security, should be marshalling and deploying resources throughout the nation. That's what FEMA does best. Under the leadership of Craig Fugate, who was the FEMA administrator during the Obama administration, FEMA really did build itself back from the dark days of Katrina to the point where it is the federal agency that can most rapidly deploy resources, whether it's packaged meals or, or test kits or, or bottled water. And so I've been disappointed not to see FEMA play more of a central role in shepherding and marshalling resources for this nationwide crisis right now. Plus, when you're dealing with so many actings in presidential appointments, Senate-confirmed presidential appointments, leads to a lot of uncertainty, job insecurity, and that's not the best place in which to govern, to deal with an unprecedented once in a century crisis like this. And so um, I, I, I'm disappointed not to see DHS more active, more in the forefront in, in dealing with this crisis. This is one of the types of things that the Department of Homeland Security, frankly, was, was made for. After 9-11, they were built for crisis because of the terrorist attack on this nation, the homeland, if you will, um, after 9-11, am I correct? DHS was created by an act of Congress in 2002. In the wake of 9-11, the, the underlying assumption then was that if you consolidate in one cabinet level department, all the different ways you can enter this country, land, sea, and air, you can prevent terrorism. Now that model is outdated because we now deal with homegrown violent extremism. But still, DHS includes FEMA, includes the Secret Service, it includes the Coast Guard, it includes the cyber security mission, as well as border security. And so DHS really should be at the forefront of dealing with a crisis like this. I know this from personal experience dealing with the Ebola virus in the fall of 2014. And I know you remember that well, April. And ever since the Ebola crisis six years ago, five and a half years ago, we have known that a lethal pandemic, a lethal virus like this has to be considered one of the top three or four homeland security threats that could strike our nation. So, Susan Rice was on here a couple of weeks ago, um, and she basically said that she left information for General Flynn, um, her designate counterpart, who was going to take that position that she had as national security advisor, and he did nothing with it. We understood that she met with at least um, 12 hours with them on this issue of pandemic, and he did nothing. Um, and the administration did nothing with the information. Now, understanding this, meaning that's already behind, you're already behind the curve. The Department of Homeland Security, you say, is kind of the one that coordinates all of this. What happens when you have a situation with not enough testing kits? Isn't the Department of Homeland Security, FEMA, in charge of testing kits, ventilators and masks, et cetera? Two things. First, Friday, January 13th, 2017, we had an extraordinary meeting, which Susan refers to. The outgoing cabinet sat down in the old executive office building with the incoming cabinet to talk about and give them a download on all the things we thought in an hour or two they should know. 
Uh -huh. And we went through what is referred to in government as a tabletop exercise, essentially a war game that included a lethal virus spreading across our country because we thought that was one of the top two or three threats that the incoming administration should be aware of and be concerned about. That's what Susan was referring to. Okay, now to your question. In order to go back to any form of normal, a new normal, where we leave the security of our homes, we go back to work, we reopen businesses, we reopen restaurants, gyms, we go back to life as we know it, testing is going to be fundamental. We have to be able to know who is contaminated with the virus, how they got it, and who they got it from. You cannot go back to an open society while the virus is still out there unless we can better detect the spread of the virus so that we can contact trace, go back to people where it came from so that we don't have an explosion of this like we did um, in the last several months. And so um, various governors and mayors are developing plans for reopening our communities and our economies. But fundamental to all of that has to be adequate testing and adequate contact tracing. Those two key things are critical to being able to reopen our, our communities and our economy. So there's been a bidding war with a month and a half or so um, over testing kits, over masks, and over ventilators. This should not have been. Correct? This should have been FEMA taking care of this. Am I correct? Correct. From the beginning, we should have invoked whatever legal authority is available, either the Defense Production Act or otherwise, to secure test kits, PPE, ventilators, so that FEMA can dispatch them to the communities most in need, rather than have state-by-state -state bidding wars, including the federal government, so that these things go to the highest bidder, rather than them going to the places where they're, they're, they're most needed. Um, if, we were, if we could roll back the clock and do it all over again, I'm quite sure when this is all over, Washington is going to do what it does best. Uh, and you know this, April, which is commissions, congressional hearings, committee hearings, IG reports on what the Trump administration should have done, should have done sooner, should have done better. But Secretary, that's but now, after the fact. People now we've got now. to figure our way out of the current crisis yeah. that we are in. That, that is so after the fact, and I get it. People, the commissions, the reports, people are hurting now. And um, not only was there a lag behind at the beginning to even cut this off at the beginning or, or mitigate it, make it small or contain it, there's still a lag now, a month and a half, a month and a half in or so. The president today gave an outline. We saw this at the briefing. He wants to deal with testing a month and a half out. Robust diagnostic testing plans, timely monitoring systems, rapid response programs. Are we way too late, Secretary Johnson? What's your question? Sorry. Are we way too late? He now rolls out this plan, at least a month and a half, two months I'll, <laughs> into this. April, I'll, I'll answer it this way. From the beginning, it has been very apparent that this president, this vice president, this administration has been overly anxious to see us all go back to life as normal, way before we were ready. I mean, you recall at one point he said, we should all be back to life as normal by Easter. Easter was weeks April 12th. Ago, and we're nowhere near close to that. Mm -hmm. Without preparing the American people for the reality that we're going to be quarantined for weeks and that until we're ready to go back, we need to stay quarantined. We need to remain disciplined. Though we can see light against the tunnel, light in, you know, at the end of the tunnel, we can't afford to get sloppy now and lower our guard. 
and start going out because the weather is getting warmer, because, you know, our president is saying it's morning in America again. Uh, we have to remain disciplined for the time being. And that's what I've been saying publicly over and over. We have to continue to listen to our mayors and governors who tell us you've got to stay quarantined for the time being until we get to where we need to be, because this virus is not going away. And so for the time being, we've got to continue to remain careful and disciplined and vigilant. I heard you say we've got to listen to our mayors and governors. You did not say the president. And that, it strikes me because I know you. I know Valerie Jarrett and I know Susan Rice very well. And yours was to support the American people, but also trust the president that you worked for. And you worked with and in the military, well, you worked with the military as the general counsel. That says a lot. I mean, speak to the times that we're in right now that we cannot believe a word that the president of the United States is saying because he, he sends mixed messages from the experts. And he tells, he says he's sarcastic, but he was not sarcastic about injecting a disinfectant into the human body, into the human system. Someone said that that's embalming someone. That's deadly. Um, he also talked about putting a UV light in some. Speak to this, please. Three things. First, the reason I say listen, the principal reason why I say listen to our mayors and governors is because the authority to tell us to stay home or to lift that executive order resides at the state and local level. The president of the United States, the federal government does not have the power to quarantine people in our homes or to issue curfews. That's something a mayor or a governor does. I'm here sheltered in my home by order of the governor of New Jersey. I'm prevented from going to my law office in Manhattan by order of the governor of New York. And so it's up to them to tell us when it is safe to leave our homes, get back on the trains, the buses, and go back to work. That's number one. Number two, as I said earlier, it is apparent that this president is so anxious to see this thing over with that he's willing to make predictions that are way too rosy that in retrospect have turned out to be wildly inaccurate. Like it's all gonna be over by Easter Sunday and we should fill the rafters in the churches on, on Easter Sunday. That was just not that was just not accurate. And last week we saw the spectacle of the president engaging in, you know, deliberations with his own advisors about disinfectants and a in theory, the body, in a human a theory body. that wasn't ready for prime time on prime time in front of millions of people. And children. And leaving his own science advisors and the health community to, to correct the record so that people don't get the misimpression, the bad misimpression that a disinfectant somehow can cure you of this virus. Let's be very, very clear. Uh, and I don't want to insult the intelligence of people watching this, but there might be somebody out there who's thinking this. You cannot, you should not, drink, eat, or otherwise ingest a disinfectant as a cure to the coronavirus. Your respiratory system is not a doorknob, okay? Your respiratory system is not a drain pipe. Um, there are things, there are poisons that can kill viruses that will kill 10 other things in your system at the same time. It is not safe. And so, uh, you know, when, when the president engages in this open deliberation like that in front of millions of people who are desperate, who are anxious, who are fearful, it, it, can, be, it can be dangerous. And so um, a lot of people feel obliged to correct the record about the dangers of a disinfectant, ingesting a disinfectant as a, some, as somehow as a cure for the coronavirus. I wanna pause right now. Um, we're talking to Obama administration, former Homeland Security Head Jay Johnson. Um, 
we're so thankful for his time. This is the man, um, if he happened to be in this administration now, he should have been tasked to be the one to basically work this out. This administration has not done that. They've even put the CDC on the sideline. We don't see Dr. Fauci anymore. Um, Dr. Briggs is out of something? Yes, sir. January 20th, 2017. Do you remember who the designated survivor was that day? It was you? Yes. So I remember I, I remember I found out. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Yes, yes. Yeah. Don't 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 steal my story. So <laughs> I was designated. But explain what the designated survivor is. I think it's occasion. this big state secret. So technically I was Donald Trump's first Secretary of Homeland Security for seven hours and thirty-two minutes into the Trump administration until my successor, John Kelly, was appointed and confirmed by the Senate. I stayed on as designated survivor, and I was the first only member of his cabinet, first person to resign from his cabinet. And I remember, you know, that this is supposed to be some super secret thing. And I get a text from Miss April Ryan saying, hello, designated survivor. <laughs> I'm so a I, good reporter. <laughs> I think the White House must have put out a statement, right? No, they didn't. No, let me tell you something. Why do you always, you see, don't insult my reporting. I've been there for four presidents for 23 years. I know the secrets. I remember I sitting here just now, I remember, hello, Mr. Designated Survivor. <laughs> Cause you know why? A lot of reporters don't do the obvious, look and see who's missing in the picture. A lot of reporters don't talk to people, just, hey, I scope, you have to know the body knives, you have to know the feel. I know the rhythms of that town. I know the rhythms of that place. So I've been there long enough to know. So, but I, but thank you for letting me know that um, I broke your little secret. But I didn't tell the world. But I knew. I for also, you. I was also designated survivor on uh, for the State of the State Union in 2016, yep. and I was in my undisclosed location, and the White House put out a statement that I was a designated survivor, and I was watching MSNBC. And Chris Matthews announced it, and he said, "We've just been handed a bulletin. Jay Johnson is the designated." <laughs> And I nearly fell out of my chair in my undisclosed <laughs> location. And then without batting an eye, I said, well, that makes sense since no presidency with the name Johnson begins well. <laughs> and your daughter's laughing. Natalie's laughing. So. <laughs> right. um, do I hear another woman in there? Again, getting some laughter from the peanut gallery. Yeah, no, it's just me. It's just in oh, the bleachers. Okay. I'm, wait I'm waiting for my girlfriend to come in. You see, okay. oh, I still well. have it. Um, April, I told you don't go there. All right. So anyway, she's not um, a public person. My mom, yeah, she's not, she's a, public not person, a public person, but she makes some. Do you care makes, about my man? She makes uh, some jewelry that. Oh, but anyway, moving on. But let's get back to this. This president um, and what he said. Um, like I said, I have two children. Well, April, Many you're on the front lines. You're the White House correspondent, not me. You know this president a lot better than I do. Anyway, I've got two children. <laughs> and my mother and father always told me, if you don't have anything nice to say, don't say it at all. I've got two children, and it hurt me last week. Um, 17 and 12, to have to go to them and say, guys, the President of the United States, you're supposed to respect and revere the office and believe that this person has the common sense, the moral character, the will, to fulfill the oath of office to protect and serve. So I had to go to my children, guys, I'm gonna say this, you, you heard the president say, um, you know, about disinfectant. I said, you know, that's not right. They were like, mom, we know, but they may know, but guess what? In the state of Maryland over the weekend, the state health department received at least 200 calls asking if it was okay to drink disinfectant. The city of Baltimore health department received calls as well. <sighs> For times such as this, moving on, I'm on my soapbox for a minute. This just it pains April, me to my heart. What's, yes, sir. what's so amazing is that his approval and disapproval ratings don't change. Views. Let me say, I'm this not going to. One of my sources today so told me they said the internal polls are not showing. It's not same, showing. It's same. No, look at the real clear politics average. It's the same 46 to 52 spread that has existed throughout his presidency. But I want to I answer your question because your question, 
your comment goes to the heart of what the American people should expect of their president. My mother's family were all native Washingtonians. I think this will resonate with you. My mother's father, my mother's aunts and uncles, they were all postal workers. They found security in the postal service and they were native Washingtonians. They were patriotic Americans. They were proud to live in the nation's capital. They were proud to be federal civil servants and they revered Roosevelt. Every, every fall, uh, a group of them would come up to near where I grew up in upstate New York to Hyde Park. It was like their pilgrimage to Hyde Park because they revered Roosevelt. And my mother remembers growing up on Maryland Avenue and on one weekend seeing Roosevelt drive by on Maryland Avenue in the convertible with the dog in the Secret Service chase car. They revered Roosevelt. They revered Truman, they revered Eisenhower, they revered Kennedy, they revered Johnson, because they looked to the president as an example. They looked to the oh. president as our, not just the CEO of the federal government, not just the politician in chief, but as our leader, as the leader of our nation who would set an example. And protect and, and serve that was, us. That was passed on to me. That was passed on to me. And I suspect a lot of people of my generation, I was born in 1957, and I'm old enough to remember a time when we had presidents who knew they could not lie to us, or who knew that they had to set the example for all the rest of us, for school children, for civil servants, for members of their own cabinet, as commander in chief of the military, for those who serve in the US military. And that's why um, it is so hard for a lot of us to get our head around where we are now. Amen. And, and once again, um, first of all, I wanna say hello to everyone, my friends, but um, Trudy, uh, Melinda, and I see uh, Secretary Johnson, the great Melba Moore said hello. She's here. Melba Moore is on. Um, so people are following us. He's smiling. He's got a little half dimple there. I see you smiling. Um, people want to hear the truth in a time when we don't know who to believe. Um, this is serious. Can I say something, about, is... that? I say something yes. about that? Over the last two months, I've done probably I've done well in excess of 30 TV interviews about the coronavirus, because I felt it important, even though I'm a private citizen now, to share my experience, to describe the roles of the federal, state, and local governments, to give people hope, explain, uh, provide facts. And I've done that across the spectrum of networks, NBC, MSNBC, CNN, Fox, Fox and Friends. I've been everywhere because I feel it's to talk to all audiences, not just talk to people who I know are already going to agree with me. And that is not without challenge or a little bit of controversy, but I feel it's important that those of us who have the perspective of occupying a seat in national security, who've had the experience dealing with something like this previously, should be talking to the public in general and not just a segment of the public who already agrees with us about lessons learned. Right. I once, is, well, saw, I once saw a liberal Democrat uh, on Bill O'Reilly's show, uh, Luis Gutierrez. You remember Luis Gutierrez, Congressman? Oh, yes. Gutierrez. I, yes, I love him. He's impressed. Luis used to be on Bill O'Reilly regularly. And I was so impressed by that. This was a man who was a the champion of immigration reform in the Congress while he was there, who had the confidence of his convictions and beliefs to take that to a hostile audience and challenge the beliefs and assumptions of an audience that wanted to disagree with him. And I was so impressed by that. And I've tried to follow a similar example. 
Well, um, hats off to you. Although there's some me, shows that just want to. So. <laughs> but for me, if I do that, I used to do Fox. But right now, if I do it, it's hazardous to my health. And that's all I'm going to say. But, um, but no, but, but this is a serious time. And we need accurate information from the players, people who know what this looks like. Um, and let's, let's be clear. COVID-19, it happened in 2019. Not what Rush Limbaugh says is the 19th version. That mm -hmm. is fake news, Rush Limbaugh. Uh, novel means new, okay? The Obama administration did not have a test kit for this <laughs> if it happened last year. This was never out. Um, we are trying to find out if this came from a market, meaning meat from a bat and there are places that 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 it's 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 what they do and, and in africa you know ebola was what was it they thought it was primates they thought it was monkeys and and i'm hearing now it's monkeys and bats correct correct um secretary johnson i've heard several different theories and one day through good research through good scholarship through good reporting through good investigative journalism, we're going to know exactly where this virus originated and how it was transmitted through China, how it was transmitted through Europe, how it was transmitted into the United States. Lab versus down market. Person. One day we will know exactly how this thing got as big as it did. For now, we've got to dig ourselves out of it. But your question touches a larger point, which has a lot to do with where we are politically. Americans now are able to get their information, their yeah. news, through a variety of sources, yes. that, that many of which have no journalistic standards. Anybody with a keyboard and access to the internet can call themselves a news source. And that's and the fact. It, and a lot of it, as you know, is wholly unreliable, false, uh, truly fake news, uh, and lacks any type of conventional journalistic standards. When I was growing up, there were basically five or six sources from which we would get our news. Uh, your local newspaper, the New York Times, the CBS Evening News, the NBC, ABC Evening News, they all had journalistic standards. We'd all be working from the same set of facts from which we could form our opinions about the Vietnam War and the Civil Rights Movement. Now, there's so many different sources of news, so-called news, that play to our pre-existing biases, leanings, prejudices, suspicions, which is how you end up with very large percentages of people believing the craziest things. It's how you, at one point, something like 40% of Republicans believing that President Obama was born in this country, because we all tend to go to sources of information that feed our pre-existing biases and prejudices, and then we stop there. And that's what and this president that, built his that's politics the large on. Reason that where I are where they that's what this president built his politics on, that singular lie that Barack Obama was born in Kenya. And that yeah. right there tells you everything about who he is and he kept it going for how long and now we're in this can't trust what he says at a dangerous time <sighs> something that you taught me a long time well, ago April, you live in this world this is your world now this is not my world you live in this world you live this i do and i'm smart enough to stay home like you instead of going to the white house right now because i like many americans have underlying issues and i will be back and i'm going to be back on cnn as well but right now we're all cocooning trying to be safe i'm not going to the nail shop to get s and s and s i'm not getting my hair i'm doing it in the house because right now it's still not safe we have got to be We've got to be very cautious and we have to really think, use common sense, use critical thinking when you are going out to save the economy, which the president wants. Is it the economy or human life? Economy or human life? Human life for me wins every time. But Secretary Johnson, something you taught me a long time ago. Um, I taught you? 
Yeah, you taught me. And I pick up, oh. yeah, you did. Um, I sit and listen to wisdom and it teaches me a lot and it, it stays with me through each administration. That's why I, I call foul because this isn't right. Um, when I know it's not right and I have a reference point, I can scream foul and give examples. Um, there was something that happened and you said, this is a national security crisis. And I said, wow. And then, and I look at the, the construct of why you called it a national security crisis. And it wasn't, I believe it was Ebola. It wasn't, but it was something. And either way, it was a lethal situation. And it wasn't at this state. And I said, my God, if that was a national security crisis, we are in a national security crisis now. Could you explain why this day, even when the president is considering opening up the economies, that we are still in a national security crisis? Could you define what national security crisis means? We're within the next, as we speak, within the next day or so, we will have, or we will surpassed three really depressing milestones. One, three million COVID cases worldwide, one million COVID cases here in this country, and a death toll of Americans in this country that exceeds the death toll of Americans in the 10-year Vietnam War. In the space of just two months, if that's not a national security crisis, here in our homeland, within our Okay, I think we lost him for a minute. Secretary Johnson, on a big piece too. Hold on. Secretary Johnson, if you leave, guys, are you getting him? Because I'm not getting him. It's recycling. Hold on. Is recycling. Okay. All right. He will he will be back. Secretary Johnson will be back. He recycled, but we're gonna get that answer back again. Secretary Johnson, if you're watching, matter of fact, let me call him and tell him to get back on his thing. Oh my gosh. Right in the middle of a good comment. So we're gonna get back with Secretary Johnson. He's gonna call back. He knows to call back. Hold on. Wow, isn't that amazing information? Stay tuned. What happened? signals this is still technology hold on hold on we're going to get him back on he's probably talking and doesn't even know he's off and i'm calling he doesn't know he's off <laughs> he's coming back he said his phone died he's coming back well you have to charge it you have to keep it charged but all right he's coming back so here's the deal here we go we got him okay he's using his daughter's phone praise be Okay, let me get on here. All right. Oop. I don't know what happened. Hold on. Let me turn it back. There we go. All right. All right. He's coming back. All right. So his phone died. Secretary, I, back. I see you, Natalie. Your daddy's phone died. The first <laughs> lesson of being Great. on IG Live. Charge your phone. <laughs> In the middle of the interview. All right. Okay. We're in back. the middle. So let's go back to national security crisis. People stay. Yes. I'm just getting warm. Go warmed. back to what, explain the definition of a national security crisis. Well, certainly when 55, 56,000 Americans die in the course of just two months, less than two months, that has got to be considered a national security crisis. It is also true that when we're in the type of nationwide crisis we're in, the diversion of resources away from normally protecting us in other, in other respects presents a crisis. I'm very worried that the Department of Homeland Security right now has been so distracted by the current crisis, as well as the leadership of our government, that we're not as focused as we should be on our national security in other respects. I'm very worried that 
we're approaching the season of severe weather systems across mm, hurricane season. So if FEMA were drawn into uh, a series of tornadoes or a hurricane, then it's going to tax our resources beyond the ability to address these problems in the midst of this nationwide crisis. Don't forget that FEMA normally responds to natural disasters in regions of the country, you know, a state here, a state there, Georgia and Alabama, or South Carolina and North Carolina, and not a nationwide crisis. And that's what we're in right now. And if all of a sudden FEMA has to deal with a major mm -hmm. natural disaster event someplace on top of this, I'm concerned that it's going to tax our resources beyond the limit. So you said something a while ago um, when you have something as lethal as this, um, where it knocks down military, it knocks down police, and it knocks down the front line. That's of a concern as well. So that kind of plays into this, right? Yes. Um, this virus, I'm quoting Tony Fauci here. This is a very efficient virus. It's, it's very contagious and it spreads rapidly in a very, very efficient, effective way. Um, I've read a lot about the science and the, uh, about this. Um, and at some point it will mutate and perhaps it won't be as lethal. And at some point we'll develop a vaccine, we'll develop a treatment in some, of some type. But right now it's a very efficient, effective virus. Think about this. At the end of February, there were just 15 cases, known cases, in the United States. Now we're about to top a million. Here we are, we're about to top a million, two months later. That's a very effective, lethal virus. So once again, say what this is, it's a what? Say again? Nas is it a national security crisis? I would characterize this, and I have characterized this as a national security crisis, very definitely. And the president has deemed this as a national emergency. Um, and it By the way, there's, that, brings up a, that brings up a good point. In a crisis, very often our political leaders lurch toward very muscular sounding declarations and invocations of authority. Like I'm invoking the Defense Production Act. Don't forget this White House floated the idea of the Defense Production Act, which was enacted in 1950 during the Korean War, but didn't really have an idea about exactly how they were going to use it. And we spent weeks about whether or not they were gonna use it, weren't gonna use it, how they were gonna use it, but he just kind of put it out there because I'm quite sure to President Trump, this sounded really powerful. It sounded muscular, just like when somebody says I'm a wartime president or I'm invoking this emergency declaration. My question is always, well, what is that going to do? What will that accomplish? What will that enable? Even though we're invoking these very big, muscular sounding things. And so and, and sometimes the press does this, too. They, they'll, there'll be a, a banner headline. President Trump invokes emergency level one. What does that mean? What does that mean? What is that going to do? Is that going to get me 50,000 more ventilators? I don't know. Hmm. So someone brought up a question that I've asked over and over again, and um, it was good. It's a good question. If indeed a country that we are engaged with in a negative way, and we've got a lot of them we're dealing with like that now, if someone tries to attack us, are we able to stand up because we're in the midst of this national security crisis? Are we able to stand up in the midst of this national security crisis against another country if they try to do something? So I don't like to speculate in that way. <clears throat> and when I was in office, um, I did not believe in scaring people unnecessarily. Or but we need the truth. I we're not getting it now. Unnecessarily. I will say that I'm very concerned that this crisis 
and this might be true of any administration, April, not just the Trump administration, this crisis has required such a vast surge of resources that under ordinary circumstances would be dedicated to protecting us in other ways. And that's not a that's not a wrap on the Trump administration specifically. That could be true of just about any any administration presiding over any government, given the fact that we're in a nationwide disaster right now. Anything else you want to add? Because we've got another component to this. Um, we're all home, and um, we're all trying to find our peace in our new normal. Yeah. And I want to go to that in a minute, but is there anything else you want to add um, as someone who sat in this lofty perch of protecting and serving America um, during the Obama administration? Yes, I do. We will get through this. Yes, we will. That where people are getting impatient, uh, the weather's getting warmer, People are getting tired of being at home. People are very anxious about the economy. They're very anxious, rightfully so, about their jobs. But so long as we remain disciplined, we stay the course, we do not heed the calls to, to act contrary to what our governors and mayors tell us to do. Um, our president only complicated the job of governors when he says things like, liberate Minnesota or liberate, liber, liberate Michigan. The word liberate, as you know, to any English speaking person implies protest, disobedience, win your freedom, I'm with you. That creates the jobs of, of governors, but we've got to stay the course. And so long as social distancing, physical distancing is working, it is working, we are flattening the curve but we're still in the depths of this crisis. And so if we abandon that prematurely, if we abandon that now, we're gonna have another surge of this virus. The virus is not going away. It is still out there. For about another two years there, Susan Rice believes it's gonna be about another two years until we get a vaccine that's mass produced and the globe has a mass immunization. I don't doubt it. I don't doubt it. And that's why it's so important that we stay the course for the time being. That is my message. Huh. How are you keeping your peace? How are you staying sane? Because you're, cause you're normally like jet setting everywhere. You're in New York in your office doing great things, meeting great people, trying to She's save your laughing. clients. She's laughing at this question. Uh, <laughs> so uh, we've been very happy here in our home in Montclair, New Jersey, where we've lived for 20, 22 and a half years. It's been an opportunity to reconnect with my wife and my daughter. Our son wears the uniform of our country. Oh. Uh, he is deployed right now. Uh, he is safe. We check in with him frequently. Um, he makes us proud, but he is safe too, but he's not here right now. Uh, but it's been a good opportunity to connect with the, with the immediate family I've created the expectation among the dogs that I'm going to walk them three times. <laughs> you got to walk the dog. For much longer. And it's an opportunity. And I'm finding that I can be quite efficient working from home here in this office, my man cave in front you of work my harder computer, from home. And, and doing national TV interviews from this chair and this vantage point, just like I'm talking to you right now. Um, without having to spend two and a half hours a day commuting to and from Manhattan. And so it's working out okay, but I am becoming anxious about returning to life as normal. I miss, oh, so you're anxious too. I miss socializing with my friends, my colleagues. I'm quite sure my daughter is anxious to go back to Brooklyn at some point. I am. There she is. She's anxious to go back to Williamsburg, Brooklyn uh, and get out of this house. Uh, so what we're out, we're anxious to go back to the new normal, but it's been, it's been good. Um, and, um, I don't want to get too comfortable. I don't believe you're anxious to go back to normal because you have, um, I have hobbies. You have, you have a hobby. Can a you hobby. show us? If you can like you show to, us? Me to share with you, so you can tell we rehearsed this. Would you like <laughs> to share with my hobby? You're not supposed to all the secrets. There we go. <laughs> 
Yes, I would love for you to share with us your hobby. I just found out about this hobby and it's beautiful. Oh Lord, he's okay. There we go. We go. Okay, we're moving. Make okay. sure Natalie's phone doesn't drop out. Take your phone. Take a phone so I can call you if it does. Okay. okay. All right. First, I got to show you a couple things. How do we yes. reverse? He's so proud of this. We got about ten minutes, so make sure make sure this works. Uh oh. No. First, first. Uh, let me show you, Doctor Charles. You're pixelating. Doctor Charles. You're pixelating. Oh, is it slow? It's is, pixelating, yes. Okay. You might not have good connection there. Do you see the image? I see somewhat of the, it's pixelated, but it's a beautiful image. That's my grandfather, that's your, Dr. Charles S. Johnson, president of Fisk it, University. Another HBC, president of Fisk University. This is my uncle, Charles S. Johnson Jr., Tuskegee Airman, right there. He can uh, help but be great. This is my great grandfather on my mother's side, upper left, um, Pullman Porter and an officer in A. Philip Randolph's union. Over here is um, uh, Robert Johnson, my other uncle, also Tuskegee Airman, part of the Freeman Field Mutiny. Do you know about the Freeman Field Mutiny, April? April Tell us about the Freeman Field Mutiny. It was depicted in, you've got another hour. It was depicted in uh, the movie Red Tails. Mm. Uh, this is my this is my great grandfather's church, Reverend Charles H. Johnson, the Lee Street Baptist Church in Bristol, Virginia. This photograph mm. started about 110 years ago. He founded the church in 1890. He was an emancipated slave, and he is in he is that little short black man right there with the hat. That is my great grandfather pastor of this church which is still there give me a uh, go back to some of the photos because that came out really nice some of the other photos were pixelated let me see oh i see oh look becoming that's your Natalie, favorite book Natalie, okay <laughs> okay i got now, it becoming the, michelle obama still available collection. in stores <laughs> this is the bumper sticker collection uh you can see how far back it goes uh these wow. are all holes originals uh, these are all original bumper stickers. So I, I never appreciate this. Right in the middle is, is uh, Nixon Lodge. It's bipartisan. There's Kennedy. OK, now we go downstairs. Okay. Are these campaigns you worked on? Uh, no. Some of those campaigns are uh, almost 100 years old, April. I know. <laughs> I said older than you. But some of them, I mean, did, were you able to work? Like, did you do anything for any of Carter, them? No. Carter Mondale, 1976. All right. My first campaign that I volunteered for. Now we're heading downstairs. Someone just asked, did you feel much pressure growing up? I mean, for real, you've got excellence in your family. You couldn't help but be who you are. Um, no, I wouldn't say that. Uh, I would say that uh, my parents encouraged me to be whatever I thought I'd be. Okay, here we go. I'm praying that, uh oh, the connection, okay. This is the hobby, okay. Uh, Natalie's phone, I don't know who her server is, but Natalie's phone is, uh oh, is doing the same thing. We've uh -oh. got a surprise for you guys. Uh oh, come on. Her phone, okay, go on in the room. Okay, guys, look at this. This is crazy. Okay, it's pixelated. He's got a train room. It's crazy. <laughs> okay, so that's that's Newark Broad Street. Uh, this is this is the Northeast Corridor, April. There's the container port. There's Hold the it still for a minute. Don't move so much. Hold on, because it's pixelating, and we want to. There's the refinery. Okay. Here is the here is the train yard here. Uh, okay. Here's the here's the uh, hot dog stand, April. It's all lit up. Look at that. There's, there's Pizza <laughs> Land, Burger King. Oh, you can't have a train yard without a Burger King. Howard Johnson's. Hojo. <laughs> KFC. Mm. What it's called Kentucky Fried Chicken. Yep, the KFC, the Colonel. Not least, Mickey D's. Okay. Look okay. at that, guys. You all rent a lot over here. Okay. April, are you? Uh, do you ride the Northeast Regional or the Acela? I do both. 
You do both. Well, you're such a high class person. <laughs> no. Which one is that going? There's the Acela. Oh, I want to ride the Acela. Look at that detail. That's amazing. How long have you had this this train run? Look at that. My stop is coming up. There Dr. We go. Jack Johnson, how long have you had the train run? Um since 2002 wow i just when we we renovated the house and we we built it back up again and i took this train set to a whole nother level and um i come Someone down said here. mr rogers neighborhood it looks like mr rogers no, neighborhood. No, there's no clock down here so i come down here and lose all track of time good for you anyway, is a, a facsimile of the apartment building that we lived in when I was first born in Corona, wow. Queens, called the Dory Miller Apartments in Corona, Queens. And so I asked my uh, train guy to build this for me, you know, fireplaces and all, you can see the fireplaces there and the, you know, the people out front. Uh, Natalie at some point is gonna paint for me the urban art that's gonna go along this wall here Wait a minute, Natalie can paint graffiti? Yes, but oh, not, not yeah. graffiti, urban art. There's a, there's a distinction between graffiti okay. and urban art. Okay, but it's all art. Art is very instrumental about the names now, I get it. Got a working traffic light. And of I course, uh, got my favorite trucks here. Uh, what's that one? Piggly Wiggly, that's down Pig south. I, Piggly I, Wiggly, we gotta go to the Piggly Wiggly. Okay. <laughs> Uh, and what's that one? Hostess, Twinkies. There you go, right, and <laughs> Which one is that? I can't see, it's kind of pixelated. Kellogg's, Rice Krispies. Exactly. Is that it? All exactly. right. Right, so. I uh, too many commercials as a kid. Basically, this is the male version of a dollhouse. This is like, you know, everybody's gotta have their toys, right? You have your hobbies, don't you? I do. I write. I'm writing a book right now while I'm, I'm writing another book in the midst of this and doing this. It's my therapy. It's cathartic. Well, everybody's got to have their toys. Yeah. And, and, and we appreciate you showing you, showing us your toys. Someone said, can we cut, can you have them back on, please, please? People want you back. What's Would that? You come back? I said, people oh. want you back. <laughs> Would you come back? When I have something, when I have to talk about, I will come back. Oh, okay? we always got something new to talk about. You are, you always give me a slow yes. It, I have to work for his yeses all the time, but they prove to be wonderful. All right. Oh, well, you got to meet the dog. There's the hey, dog. Doggy. Here, pup. Where are you? Where are you? Come on. Uh, I shaved mine the other day. I shaved my dog's head. Uh, the other day, um, I'm oh, yes. hi, pup. He's a puppy, well, he's a year old. Aww. All right, April. Well, you, we you, have you, a, a minute and 27 seconds left, and I well, want to thank you. you. Well, I, I, get the, I get the last 27 seconds. Continue to be, continue to excel, uh, keep up the fight on the front lines. You got to be the champion for the First Amendment. You're you're in the trenches. You're on the front lines, right there in the White House, in the in the briefing room every day. It's tough. Well, I'm not there. I'm not there this week or this next month, but I'll be back. But I want to say something, guys. When Sean came after me, it was Valerie Jarrett and this man who called to check on me. And you always have to have good people, really, who check in on you, and you check in on them. So I just wanted to put my eyes on, to make sure he was okay. And then while while I did that, I wanted them to give us a little knowledge. And I hope you enjoyed the knowledge. And Secretary Johnson, you mean the world to me, you and your family. And I so appreciate you and what you have imparted on us tonight. Hey, Natalie, I see you, girl. <laughs> and we appreciate you so much. And you have the last word. We've got 27 seconds. All right, April, keep up the good fight. Keep up, keep doing what you're doing. We love you. Natalie, love you love too. You. I'm going to watch your show. Send me a link. Okay. So guys, guys, 
Secretary Jay Johnson, if you in the didn't words, see. The words, in the words of my Morehouse brother, Martin Luther King, keep on keeping on. Amen. Peace. God bless.